Matthew Bell with Alzheimer'sProof.com, and today I want to talk about simple disinfecting and sanitizing procedures that you can implement in an influenza outbreak or for seasonal illness or other kinds of things that might be going on. In a previous video, I gave three tips for how to avoid getting sick, for how to avoid spreading illness. They're very general tips. The first is simply washing your hands. The second is maintaining a proper diet. And the third is maintaining proper distance, self-quarantine, just separating yourself, essentially staying at home if necessary. Subsequently, I received a public service announcement that was facilitated by Google, but which was cited to the World Health Organization and the Centers for Disease Control, the CDC. And it's called Do the Five. So the first one is wash your hands. Same thing that most everybody else is, is saying. Very simple thing, but it's often neglected because we're in a hurry. It's been estimated that up to 80% of infectious diseases are transmitted because of inadequate hand washing. The second tip was cough into the elbow. We've been hearing about this, so turning this aside, coughing into the elbow so that it's not on your person, it's not on your hand, and it doesn't get on other people. The third tip is not to touch your face, to try and remember to not touch your face. The third is to keep an adequate distance between persons, and in this case, we're talking about a group setting to leave at least three foot. I've also seen six foot as the adequate recommended space. But the fifth tip is simply stay home. Now that is the public service announcement. Some of those things I touched on previously, they didn't bring in diet, I did. So you can see the previous video for that, but I also have expanded on that in other videos. And it turns out that just good diet practices are going to serve you well, not simply for maintaining cognitive function, which is the specific focus of this channel, but also for general health considerations, as is the case right now. But what I didn't really get into, and haven't gotten into in other places, is actual simple disinfecting procedures, so I thought I would tackle that today. This is especially important for persons who might be caretakers for those who are cognitively impaired, including for persons who have Alzheimer's disease and for dementia, and there's two reasons for that, at least. And the first reason is that often these cognitive impairments afflict people in advanced age, and persons in advanced age can have other conditions that reduce their immunity or make them more susceptible to illness or make it more serious if they do get an infection. So it's best to be extra careful with sanitation and disinfection and hygiene around these people, especially if you're a caretaker. But the second reason is that persons who have cognitive impairments are unlikely to be able to remember to do or to adequately do any of the five things that we just canvassed in terms of that public service announcement. So they may not wash their hands correctly. They may not cough or cough into their elbow. They may not have the wherewithal to keep their hands away from their face. They may not keep adequate distance. I mean, they might not be mobile, but if they are, they may not be able to remember to keep that adequate distance. And the fifth thing that says stay home, obviously, if a person has some ability to ambulate or be mobile, they might not adhere to that one either. So I thought these tips would be good, secondly, for people who might be visiting a loved one in an assisted care facility, in a nursing home, or other long-term care facility, it might be good to have some tips as to how they can kind of bring disinfecting procedures into the nursing home, at least in the living space that their loved one occupies. So I thought I'd start with this. According to the Public Library of Science, in their journal one, there's an article that talks about influenza outbreaks. It is often the case that many people are cared for and nursed back to health in the home environment. And so they make the comment that it would be a good idea to have a familiarity with basic disinfecting procedures because if you're caring for someone in your home environment, this might be a real issue for you. Simple methods that can help you to stop the spread within the household. And they mention that this is quite possible to do with very easily obtainable items and very easily obtainable chemical cleaners. Very simple. It doesn't require a whole lot. It's not like you need specialized super industrial strength chemicals for this. According to their study, you don't. You can do simple wipes and simple cleaning agents within certain parameters, and we'll get into that. They call it availability of low-tech cleaning agents. The first one that they mention is bleach, and they talk about it in at least a 1% dilution. The second is vinegar, and that's going to be in a 10% dilution. Now, they talk about malt vinegar, but you could easily substitute white vinegar or apple cider vinegar, and probably going to get virtually the same results. And the third is what they refer to in the article as washing up cleaner, or it, we would refer to it in the States as dishwashing fluid. I think that the study was actually conducted in the United Kingdom. But I should point out there's a difference between actually removing a germ and killing it. So there is a way of removing the germ, and in fact there's even a third category of just deactivation. So some of these cleansers, more like the bleach side of things, are going to kill the germ, almost for sure. 
On the other side of it are going to be things like just washing your hands with soapy water. It's going to remove the germs, hopefully, if you do a thorough drop cleansing, but it's not going to kill them. And then there are certain things in between, like the washing up fluid or the dish detergent angle, where you might find that those things both wash it away, but also deactivate some of the viral material. Now, I'm not a biologist or a researcher or a chemist, so I'm not going to get into that chemistry. If you're interested, I'm sure that the article goes into that in greater depth, and you're welcome to certainly follow up those leads. As always, this is simply for general informational or entertainment purposes. This is an actual advice, but there are research leads that I invite you to follow up on if you're interested. But the point is you don't need a whole lot of specialty products. Now, they do say you should probably avoid baby wipes for disinfection, and that's because baby wipes don't have a lot of the chemicals or hardly any of the chemicals that would be necessary to actually deactivate or kill some of these viral and bacterial materials. All they're going to really do is kind of smear them around. And so even though a baby wipe can be good, obviously it's, it's very easy on the skin for the little ones, it's not going to be adequate for cleansing a, a table surface if you want it to be disinfected. Now they singled out bleach in the article, and this is probably the most effective disinfectant that you can obtain easily, just bleach. Of course you can obtain just generic type bleach, I have it here in a, in a large uh, container, but you can also obtain bleach infused wipes like these Clorox wipes. And they even list on here, if you read the packaging, it'll actually say kills the cold and the flu. And you can see it in addition to other bacteria like E. coli and various other things. Now, some people like to use vinegar. And here I have a little container of apple cider vinegar. Other people recommend a kind of a one-two punch with vinegar being the first application followed by an application of hydrogen peroxide. So you wouldn't mix them together. Rather, you put the vinegar on first and then you would put the hydrogen peroxide. Now, following up that very quickly is going to be Lysol. So Lysol, of course, has a number of killing characteristics on it. It says it kills 99%, 99.9% .9 percent of viruses and bacteria. And if you look at the more comprehensive list of these things on the back, you'll find that it does list influenza A, avian flu, influenza B, rhinovirus, and so on down the line. Of course, there are many different types of blend for Lysol. There's even air deodorizing Lysol spray. And so Lysol is readily available as well. It looks like from some of the very quick research that I did, it looks like bleach might be a little bit able to edge it out and then Lysol right underneath that. Now another one is going to be isopropyl alcohol or denatured alcohol. Now this is going to be effective at certain things. I think it is effective against the flu. There are going to be certain conditions and certain objects you might want to concentrate on cleaning with this as opposed to bleach. So for example your eyeglasses which is something that might be on your face. Obviously those need to be cleaned, but you're going to want to use something very gentle. A spritz of alcohol and some kind of a microfiber cloth or some kind of an eyeglass friendly cleaning cloth that is capable of being sprayed with an alcohol spray and just gently wiping the glass frame down can be very effective because in that case you're not going to want to put bleach on your eyeglasses. But you also have hand sanitizer that includes ethyl alcohol and ethyl alcohol hand sanitizers are going to be good, especially in a pinch on the fly. I always carry some with me in my pocket. It's a tiny little container of it, and the label has long since been obliterated, but I always carry that on me. Now, not all of these are equal, so there is a sense in which vinegar, for example, which a lot of people do appreciate because it's more natural, maybe it's less harsh than bleach and so on, it is not a registered disinfectant. Now, there's, there is in the United States the Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA, and the EPA actually maintains a list of registered disinfectants. Now, that list is updated, has been updated, for the most recent virus that we're contending with, and those chemicals that are specifically listed for that include anything from something called quaternary ammonium all the way to sodium hypochlorite or regular bleach Clorox, and include many, many other exotic commercial grade industrial strength chemicals. I'm not going to get into that, but you're welcome to visit that list. But once again, the whole thrust of this is that you can be effective disinfecting with very easily obtainable cleaners. You don't need to have any kind of exotic stuff on the shelf that they would use in a hospital. You can actually use just regular old bleach for a lot of applications or regular isopropyl or rubbing alcohol. So a couple things to consider. The first is going to be the contact time. So on the EPA's registered list, you'll find that one of the columns includes the amount of time that that chemical has to be in contact with the viral material or germ in order to be effective at sanitizing the surface. And so that 
you can visit it. I, it was a much longer list than I've got time to even present on, but most of the times range between about five minutes of contact time and 10 minutes. On the container of Lysol, I noticed that it said that it has the ability to deactivate or kill most viruses in about three minutes but leaving it on for a little longer, probably a safe bet. And the second concern and consideration in this regard is gonna be not reintroducing germs into the area that you just sterilized. So hand washing is again going to be preeminent. So if you bother to disinfect your loved one's living space or your own living space, but you forget to wash your hands and you just simply reintroduce germ material onto the newly cleaned hardware, it's going to be counterproductive, it's not going to do any good. So you want to make sure you don't pick up germs from the surface and you want to make sure you wash your hands and not reintroduce them back onto the newly disinfected surface. But in thinking about the home environment first, what types of things are you going to want to concentrate on? Well obviously the doorknob going in and out, the exit and entry door, those are going to be things that might be touched by more people more frequently. I mean the home, if your home is not high traffic and you don't have a lot of visitors coming in, it's mostly just going to be you or your loved one, or both in a care sort of situation, then all the doorknobs inside, the dining table, of course you're going to want to make sure that the silverware and, and plates and so on are also disinfected, but you're not going to do that with chemicals in terms of bleach and so on. You're going to just make sure you use adequate dishwashing practices. So if you've got your dishwasher turned up to hot, and you have the heated cycle on or whatever, that's going to be effective. If your loved one sits at a chair that's got armrests, you probably want to disinfect the armrests, places, any place where you put your hands. So light switches, the knobs on lamps, of course, faucets, faucets in the kitchen, in the bathroom. If you have a utility sink, a wet bar sink, any of those things, you're going to want to disinfect the faucet, disinfect the sink basin, disinfect the bathtub area. Probably the most important sinks to clean are going to be the bathroom and the kitchen. Now while you're at it, you may as well disinfect the toilet, but the toilet is probably going to be less vital when we're talking about a respiratory infection, but it's certainly going to be important when we're talking about something like norovirus or something that's going to be um, associated with gastrointestinal distress or the stomach flu. Then there are some things that you might not usually think of, like your keys, for example. You touch those constantly, put them into your pocket, Another one's going to be your cell phone. If you have a computer, the computer mouse, the keyboard on the mouse. Now, obviously, the kind of cleanser you're going to want to select, you want it to be effective at, at disinfecting, but you also have to select it carefully for the application. So in the example I gave previously, you wouldn't want to use bleach on your eyeglasses. Well, you certainly wouldn't want to use bleach either on your cell phone. You wouldn't want to use it on your computer keyboard or, or certain things like this. So in those cases, you might favor some kind of isopropyl or rubbing alcohol application. So once again, the procedure would be to apply the alcohol to a microfiber cloth, preferably, so that you minimize scratching on things like the surface of the cell phone or on your eyeglass lenses. You could also apply it to a Q-tip to get some of those harder to reach spaces. You want to make sure you take any covers off of your phone before you put the cover back on the phone. After the phone has been allowed to dry, you want to make sure that you've cleaned the cover. Now this could be done with some kind of alcohol solution, but it could also just be done with dish detergent, just kind of washing it with soapy water is probably sufficient. Make sure it's dry, put it back together. Obviously use your common sense and not submerge these. You don't want to submerge your phone in water, you're going to ruin it, same thing with your keyboard. So you have to use some, some sense about which ones to select. But something like disinfecting the kitchen sink or the bathroom sink, you could very well use bleach for that, Lysol perhaps. Now there are certain cleansers like Mr. Clean, and Mr. Clean lists that it's antibacterial. I couldn't find anywhere where it indicates that it has antiviral properties. So I would probably caution against relying exclusively on something like this. It might be suitable for deactivating it or for just simply washing it away. But probably if you want to be safe using a bleach-based cleaning disinfecting procedure, possibly followed up with something like this. I mean, it wouldn't hurt. And it might, if you're opposed to the smell or reverse to the smell of the bleach, then you might follow it up just to simply give the room a more pleasant smell. Now let me talk for just a minute about visiting your loved one in a nursing home or in an assisted living environment. It could be independent living, it could be an apartment complex, and these same kinds of considerations would apply. So of course washing your hands. If you have to go through a common area, if you have to touch elevator buttons, if you have to open the main doors, these are going to be high traffic areas. If you have to grab a pen and sign in, 
again, how many people have touched that pen? The pen's probably never been cleaned. So those are really important for you to be mindful and not touch your face and not greet your loved one with a handshake before you've washed your hands properly. Now, once you're in their environment, it's going to depend. Obviously, if they're in a completely segregated independent living facility where they have everything they need within their own area, then you're going to clean it just like you would your own home. If they are in a shared bedroom or a private bedroom and they share other facilities with residents, then you clean what you can. But those, again, are going to include things like doorknobs and light switches. If they have their own alarm clock, you'd want to clean that, especially if the staff comes in and sets it for them. If they have a phone, they may or may not, depending on the kind of impairment and the level of impairment, but if they do, you'd want to clean the phone for sure. Being careful to get into any mouthpiece or speaker areas. Clean the toilet, clean the bathroom area if you have access to it. It wouldn't hurt to bring some wipes with you. And a second thing is you can often get a travel size container for some of these things. So here's a tiny little travel size Lysol that I usually take with me if I have to go on a business trip. And once again, I always have the hand sanitizer. And in a pinch, you can actually squirt the hand sanitizer onto some kind of a napkin or something and use that. And then in the facility, you'd probably want to ask them about what are their procedures for disinfecting, for dishwashing, for preparation of meals, for cleaning the dining area ask them about what they do in common areas to clean them. What do they do for elevators and doorknobs? Are they disinfecting those? And any other concerns that you have. I should also point out that in the case of a person who is either afflicted with Alzheimer's or some kind of cognitive impairment or other form of dementia, or who has physical disabilities, there may be other things that you're going to want to disinfect as well. So those might include things like a cane or a walking stick. Again, I said eyeglasses, but if they have specialty glasses or other medical equipment, you're going to want to investigate how to properly disinfect those. So if you have a visiting nurse or some kind of an aide, you probably want to confer with the aide or nurse before you just start fidgeting with the medical equipment, particularly if there's oxygen canisters or other ways of administering um, intravenous medicines or anything like this. There probably are ways of disinfecting those, but you probably want to leave that to the expert or let the nurse, him or her, to investigate the proper way to disinfect that. Now, also you want to think about areas that your loved one touches. So this could be grab bars, handrails, if they kind of cruise and touch their hands on the wall in a particular area or on shelves or on the surface of a table and you notice this and they do it consistently, disinfect that as well. And finally, from all I can think of here, their walker, their wheelchair is probably going to have the need to do this. Again, be careful if it's motorized that you're not pouring liquid chemicals on anything that might have battery or electrical circuits. Again, use common sense, confer with the expert or nurse if you have questions, and sort of just survey the environment. I would just take my canister of Lysol with me and just kind of walk the living environment and kind of just imagine yourself touching and interacting with it, and anything that you think could be safely disinfected, go ahead and do it. Again, you got to be careful. Some of these chemicals can stain, they can ruin fabric, they can be dangerous. So for example, Bleach can certainly burn the eyes, the skin, and, and certainly you wouldn't want to ingest it. So be very careful. If you do have a person who's cognitively impaired, you probably want to do the disinfecting procedures with them safely away, especially if you have to leave these things for five or ten minutes. Always make sure you come back to clean it up so you don't leave anything. You don't want to disinfect, let's say, the floor and have somebody slip and fall. So be careful when you're doing this. But these are just a couple of practices. I'm not an expert. I'm not a medical practitioner. So please don't take this as advice. Research leads only. But I do wish you the best. If you found something of use in the video, I ask that you like it, subscribe to the channel, click the notification bell to be alerted to new content as it becomes available. I thank you so much for being with me today. I, I wish you well, and I hope that you can stay healthy.